This talk is about the intricacies of one of the profound issues at the interface of the natural sciences, philosophy and the social sciences. It is about interpreting our role, the conscious human brain's role within the physics of nature. It's the role of subject of cognizance, where cognizance means knowledge or awareness. So is the subject of cognizance a passive observer of nature or an active participant within nature? I think its better interpretation would be the participating observer. Subject of cognizance as the participating observer. Specifically, this talk focuses on the necessity of such an interpretation and its potential usefulness in developing a human inclusive and more holistic view of the physics of nature. I'll also briefly point out how the social scientific research, especially that involving human behavior and decision making, could benefit from such an interpretation. Each individual conscious human brain is constantly sensing and perceiving the information coming from its surroundings. This way it can be regarded as an observer of nature. Also, it is constantly processing that information to make choices, take decisions and perform actions in its surroundings. In this sense, it can be regarded as a participant within nature as well. Thus, this subject of cognizance seems like playing a dual role, isn't it? By the way, the term participating observer has nothing to do with one of the research methodologies employed in anthropology or sociology, which is called participant observation, which is totally different. What I mean is an interpretation of the subject of cognizance as the participating observer. But at the first place, why worry about interpreting its role in physics? Let's take an example of a chain of processes. Say there occurs a very bright lightning in the sky and a person standing close to a window witnesses it and gets scared. He throws himself in the nearby couch while unknowingly kicking off a glass of water kept on a nearby teapot. The glass falls on the floor and breaks into pieces. Now how would you analyze by applying physics the causal connectedness of this chain of processes. All right, before getting into the analysis of this situation, let's consider in short what has been the physicist's way of comprehending the workings of the universe. Physics has a long standing, many centuries old history of developments. In the ancient era, it used to be called the natural philosophy. Today it can be said that physics is the body of an all-inclusive, fundamental, philosophical and scientific knowledge of nature, of the workings of the universe. Now, During this whole period of developments, one of the most prominent tenets to which physicists have fairly maintained their commitment is the principle of causality. The belief in the causal connectedness of things happening in the universe, the belief that every effect as a cause. So understanding physics of a given natural process, for example, how water boils, why sky appears blue, how does the propagation of light take place in different media, how do the black holes form and so on, requires analyzing the chain of the causally connected sub-phenomena leading to its occurrence. For this, physicists propose theoretical models of reality. They also perform experiments to find out what's actually going on in nature, how one thing leads to another and how a cause leads to an effect. Now some of those experiments lead to new observations, asking for an explanation in terms of new, more general and more realistic theoretical models, providing even deeper causal descriptions of reality. This has always been our way to comprehend the nature, the universe, and no doubt it has led to a tremendous success in our understanding of nature. Now, in the case of the causal connectedness of the chain of processes from the lightning in the sky to the breaking of the glass, it's possible to explain the physics of lightning and the mechanism of seeing and hearing then we can say that gravity caused the falling of the glass and also can explain the physics behind breaking of the glass. So that's it. 
lightning, seeing and hearing, falling and breaking. We would apply physics to understand the causality behind the occurrence of only these processes. But then, aren't we missing out something in the analysis? Aren't we excluding the contribution coming from the subject of cognizance? Schrodinger has already pointed out the problem with this exclusion of the subject of cognizance about treating it as an onlooker, as he calls, that is a non-participating passive observer. While comprehending or witnessing the processes occurring in the nature, we indirectly assume ourselves as mere observers. We forget that this process of comprehending or witnessing is itself a natural process, very much happening within the universe. So in our analysis, we are missing out the details of the physics that causes the process of scaring after seeing and hearing the lightning. We are also missing out the details of the physics that causes the scared person to throw himself on the couch, which is in turn causing his kicking of the glass. Aren't these natural processes, whatever may be their nature, aren't these processes parts of the chain of events from the lightning in the sky to the breaking of the glass? Don't they qualify as causes and effects? What are the criteria for disqualifying them as causes and effects? I mean, why can't getting scared, for example, be taken as an effect caused due to the lightning? Why can't kicking of the glass be taken as the primary cause that, at the first place, drives the glass out of its equilibrium position, thereby leading to its consequent fall due to gravity? I'm sure no one will say that these are wrong questions, but usually we don't pay attention to such questions. Whatever is the example of the situation, we don't consider questions involving a person's role in the actual physics of happening. Anyway. Lightning, seeing, hearing, falling and breaking can certainly be fairly explained on the basis of classical physics. Apparently, without any need for the inclusion of the subject of cognizance in the analysis. Even in Einstein's relativity, the notion of an observer is precisely this. Non-participating and passive, separated from what's being observed. Okay, Am I saying that Classical physics is wrong because it doesn't include the subject of cognizance in the physics of happening. No, not at all. There is no doubt that the classical theories of physics, the paradigms of Newtonian physics, the mechanistic framework, the relativistic physics, to a certain extent, do provide realistic models of nature. Come on, under appropriate conditions, these are experimentally verified paradigms. Not just this. We have also seen engineering and technology working on the classical principles and an experimentally verified and technologically applied theory of physics is never wrong in its domain of applicability. But classical physics speaks for just one domain of applicability and there are other even deeper domains of nature too. For example, quantum physics does not support such a separability between the observer and the observed. Based on the notions of entanglement and non-locality, the formulation of quantum theory applies to the universe as an undivided whole, which naturally includes the subject of cognizance. This way, it can even no longer be considered as just a subject. It can be regarded as an object too an object of cognizance for the other subsystems present in its surroundings in the universe. This way, it seems plausible how the conscious human mind residing within the universe as both the subject and the object may be understood as a system having an inseparable, perhaps non-local dual nature, that of a participating observer. Now the chain of events from the lightning in the sky to the breaking of the glass provides, without loss of generality, an example of conscious human mind playing the role of a causally functioning participating observer. A denial 
of its contribution in the causal connectedness in such situations seems unjustifiable in general. Of course, this doesn't mean that it's possible to figure out all the physics details of the causally and non-locally functioning conscious human brain by simply interpreting it as a participating observer. No, not at all. Understanding human consciousness is a mysterious problem since many, many centuries. And the workings of the human brain has always been a puzzling issue. For example, the participation of the conscious systems into the dynamics of nature is triggered by sensing, perceiving and processing that information from surroundings. This is primarily related to their ability to function as experiencing physical systems. One of the most challenging aspects about the problem of understanding human consciousness. It is the mind matter problem. It is the hard problem of consciousness as pointed out by David Chalmers. How does and where does the subjective experience arise from the physical brain material? But although this is an extremely challenging field of research, the contributions of many physicists, including Eugene Wigner, David Bohm, Sir Roger Penrose, Henry Stapp, suggest an unavoidable role of human consciousness in quantum physics. Therefore, a more complete physics account of the entire chain of the causally connected events such as those discussed in our example will require the development of a scientific model of nature that has a room for the inclusion of the conscious systems into the whole dynamics of nature. Today, several groups have already rolled up their sleeves to understand the physics of consciousness, that of the subjective experience that of the decision-making processes and also to use this understanding to model human behavior in the social context. The details or even a summary of the precise findings of such research efforts is clearly beyond the scope of this talk. Nevertheless, to give you a flavor, I would like to very briefly mention two interesting research pathways where interpreting the conscious human mind as a participating observer could prove to be useful. One has to do with the understanding of the quantum physical processes underlying human consciousness and subjective experience. There are some recent interesting contributions, for example, from Professor Christophe Simon, University of Calgary, Canada, and his co-workers in the field of quantum neuroscience. These contributions throw light on the possible role of entanglement and non-locality in the conscious cognitive processes taking place in the human brain. The other has to do with using deep insights from physics to develop a causal viewpoint for the activities involving human decision making. In an upcoming research monograph under the Cambridge University Press, me and my colleague, Professor Emmanuel Haven from Memorial University, Canada, will present a detailed framework for the economic sciences with a quantum theoretical approach to the modeling of the behavior of the agents of economy. But why economic sciences? Because as we know, the economic financial world daily involves tremendous decision-making activities. And this makes it a test bed for the idea of conscious decision making human mind as the participating observer. I mean the duly functional role of each of the conscious human agents of economy both as a participant and as an observer is apparent there. I anticipate that a blend of the findings of such research efforts bringing together quantum neuroscience and social sciences could lead to a novel research program in the near future. Specifically, it will have the potential to provide more realistic models capturing the human decision-making processes in different socio-economic contexts. And possibly, such models will be based on our ever-improving understanding of the quantum physical, causal and non-local functioning 
of the subjectively experiencing participating observers. In his famous book, The Phenomenon of Man, the French philosopher Pierre Teilhard de Chardin remarks, the true physics is that which will one day achieve the inclusion of man in his wholeness in a coherent picture of the world. Perhaps the blending of the findings from the natural and the social sciences along with the interpretation of conscious human mind's dual role as a participating observer can be seen as a means to transform such a philosophical remark into a proper scientific model. And I hope that such a scientific model will provide a new coherent approach to achieving a human inclusive and holistic understanding of the physics of nature. To me, this sounds like a wonderful exploration. Thank you very much for listening, dear participating observers.